going to take a break from uh, the book of Acts this week. You know, my, my son Graham is here. For, he's the pastor of the uh, Grace Highlands Presbyterian PCA Church in Boone, North Carolina, and he's been with us this week. And so I asked him if he would come and preach the word uh, from Exodus this morning. He's been going through the book of Exodus. Preach the word, brother. Well, good morning, it's a privilege to be here and open up the word with you guys. We're gonna be looking at Exodus chapter 30, so I'd invite you to turn your Bibles there uh, this morning as we jump into the middle uh, of the book of Exodus. I'll give you a brief just overview of what we uh, would expect this book about. We know about the first part, there's really three parts to it. The first part is the the Exodus, the deliverance of God's people uh, from Egypt, and that's the first 15 chapters. And then there's a transition into the wilderness and they come out and the second component is at Sinai. And that's where God first delivers them and then he, he makes them his covenant people. In chapters 19 through 24, we get the laws of the covenant, the, the covenant ratification ceremony and those promises made there. And, and then we're, the, the third section, really God, he delivers his people so they can be his covenant people in order to dwell with him. And then that final section, really chapters 25 through 40, are all about how God is gonna dwell with his people, and that's gonna be through the tabernacle. Probably not a section you read regularly as it just gives object after object of the way that God is gonna dwell with his people. And this morning, we're gonna look at one of those objects, uh, one of those uh, symbols that God gave his people to show them who he was and to really point to Christ. And that will be uh, what's called the incense altar or the golden altar. Uh, And so I'll be reading from Exodus chapter 30. Uh, The Israel will construct this in Exodus 37, but these are God's instructions uh, to uh, Moses while he is on Sinai uh, about uh, this particular piece of furniture in the tabernacle. This is the word of God Almighty. Exodus 30, starting at verse one. Make an altar of acacia wood for burning incense. It is to be square, a, a cubit long and a cubit wide and two cubits high. It's horns of one piece with it. Overlay the top and all the sides and the horns with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Make two gold rings for the altar below the molding, two on opposite sides to hold the poles used to carry it. Make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Put the altar in front of the curtain that is before the ark of the testimony, before the atonement cover that is over the testimony where I will meet with you. Aaron must burn fragrant incense on the altar every morning when he tends the lamps. He must burn incense uh, incense again when he lights the lamps at twilight. So incense will burn regularly before the Lord for the generations to come. Do not offer on this altar any other incense or any burnt offering or grain offering and do not pour a drink offering on it. Once a year, Aaron shall make atonement on its horns. This annual atonement must be made with the blood of the atoning sin offering for the generations to come. It is most holy to the Lord. And then I'd ask you to skip down to verse 34 and we'll just read about the incense there, verse 34 of the same chapter. Then the Lord said to Moses, take fragrant spices, gum, resin, ancha, and galabum, and pure frankincense, all in equal amounts, and make a fragrant blend of incense, the work of a perfumer. It's to be salted and pure and sacred. Grind some of it to powder and place it in front of the testimony in the tent of meeting where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. Do not make any incense with this formula for yourselves. Consider it holy to the Lord. Whoever makes any like it to enjoy its fragrance must be cut off from his people. So ends the reading of God's word this morning. Let's go before him in prayer. Please, please bow with me. Lord, we, we come before you and we ask that you would Uh, illuminate your word and make it clear and plain to us. Uh, Show us who you are and show us our savior. I pray that you would uh, give strength to the preacher and that you would bring listening, open ears to your people, that they may be refreshed 
and built up by your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, smells kind of add zest and pop to life, don't they? they? That smell of Thanksgiving turkey that wafts through the house or uh, the smell of the salty air when you finally get out of the car and make it to the ocean or that musty smell of the family cabin. The smells bring us back to places and events. We think of that fragrance that we remember, that perfume, that flower, that family farm, that city street, that mountain air, whatever it may be. It, they they bring us back and they add a, a, a zest and the enjoyment of life. They really are the aromas of life. And, and, and here in the tabernacle, God has designed there to be a smell, a smell that the priests would never forget, right? They would only smell it here. And every time they walked in, they would smell this aroma and it would have pr- spread throughout so the people that came up would have probably smelled this certain specific fragrance, The tabernacle was a place of strong aroma unto the Lord. Well, that leads us to ask, well, why does God want this aroma in the tabernacle? What is this altar for? What is incense for? And what does it actually have to do with my life? Uh, And we're going to sort of try to unpack this object and see what it is and how it functions. And as we do that, we have to remember what the tabernacle is, where where this is in the tabernacle. If we were entering the tabernacle, we would enter through the the, the main curtain and we'd be in the courtyard. Uh, And in front of us would be the bronze altar. Uh, uh, Not this altar, but the altar where the sacrifices were made. There'd be fire and smoke coming up. Uh, and then we'd pass the bronze altar and we'd get to the, the, the bronze washing basin where the priests would wash if they wanted to give a sacrifice or ever enter the tabernacle. Uh, and then we'd, after passing those through, we'd, we'd make it into the tabernacle itself. Only the priests can go in here and into this tent. Uh, and, and as we would enter, we'd probably see incense and smell it per, per, uh, permeating this whole room. On our left would be the golden menorah with light shining out. And on our, our right would be the, the table bread, the, the, the bread, uh, the table of showbread or the bread of presents. And then directly in front of us, we'd walk between those two objects, would be the golden altar the altar of incense. Uh, There'd be a a curtain right behind it, but it would be right in the middle of that room or the back wall, as it were, of that room. And what would it look like? What would we see? How is it described for us here? We see its material. It's acacia wood. It's it's gilded with gold. Uh, Thus, it's called sometimes the golden altar as opposed to that bronze altar that was out in the the courtyard. Uh, It's about three feet high, Uh, And it's about one and a half by one and a half feet square. So it's not a large uh, altar like the one out there. It has horns on the altar, uh, which which was a sign that it was an altar. And it has these two rods uh, that would have been used to make it portable. Remember that the tabernacle is God dwelling with his people. And really the, the tabernacle is the portable version of the temple. So we really, if you're thinking of those two things, we could see the tabernacle and temple almost interchangeably. There is distinction, but... They're basically the portable version of the temple. Now, as we think about this object, the the first thing we need to ask is where is it? What is its location? And this is very key to understanding it. It is in front of the veil just before the Holy of Holies, right up against that veil. And if you recall or know the Holy of Holies, what's inside that? The Ark of the Covenant, which is the throne of God. Or as our text says here twice, where I will meet with you. And really in the book, and when it describes in Kings the temple and when the book of Hebrews describes this, it actually places this altar with the Holy of Holies. It's so linked to the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant, it's practically inside. It's literally the portal to the Holy of Holies. And so approaching this altar brings the priest right in front of the Ark of the Covenant, or the throne of God. And this is the closest any priest is ever going to get to God, except on the Day of Atonement, only the high priest, only once a year, would ever enter. But generally, this is the closest they're ever going to get. So they're standing before an altar that puts them a foot and a half from God, with with a veil holding back the glory cloud behind the presence of God. That's the location of this altar. Uh, and what, how does 
this altar get lit? We're going to have to understand the source of this altar. Uh, where does it receive its fire? And we can see from, it doesn't tell us here, but from other places, it becomes pretty clear that the implication is the priests get fire from the bronze altar, which is always to be burning with fire. And so its source is from the bronze altar. They bring coals from there and they would light their censers and bring it in to this altar. And when does the the priest approach this altar with this fire? It tells us here twice daily, right? Morning and evening. He's to be doing this. So when he'd go in in the morning and evening, there'd be a morning and evening sacrifice. And they'd also go in and they'd they'd get the the menorah light, uh, the golden lampstand lit and the the wicks right and refill the oil. And then they bring this incense. So twice a day they approach. And, And really what's the purpose of bringing the fire to the altar? It's to burn this incense, to, to bring the incense to the Lord. And so if we were to kind of summarize what this object is, God is commanding his priest to approach him to burn incense every morning and evening so that there's a perpetual offering rising up to the Lord. Well, then that leads to a question about, well, what is incense? I mean, what is it for at least? What does it symbolize? Why does God want incense? What, what does it signify to us? What does the Bible teach us about incense? Uh, incense is uh, in the Bible 150 times the word. It's in 143 verses. It's all over the place. And it has a couple of meanings. One, sometimes it's just in those lists where merchants are bringing all their goods into the city or kings have lists of all their good wealthy stuff and gold might be there and cattle might be there and incense is thrown in as a valuable object. Uh, so we know it's valuable, but that doesn't tell us what it signifies, what God is symbolizing by the incense. Uh, and so what, is it, what does it actually mean? We're going to look at the meaning of incense generally, and then we'll look at the meaning of incense specifically. So we'll look at it generally, and then we'll get a little bit more specific. Incense, uh, really, if we had to generally say it, incense is worship. Incense is part of worship. Uh, in the various religious activities uh, of the Old Testament, over and over, incense is part of it. Uh, when Moses blesses the Levites and he describes what the Levites, the priests do. He says that they, uh, they, they teach the precepts of, of the law and then they offer incense before you, that is God, and they offer whole burnt offerings. That's Deuteronomy 33.10. So the priests, their job, when you were to summarize it, was the word, sacrifices, and incense. That's, that's their whole job in a nutshell. And over and over in various activities, it's used. But it's also used in a negative sense when there's bad worship, when there's wrong worship. Remember, Israel goes off onto idolatry. And if you look at it in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the refrain is that the people were offering sacrifices and burning incense. It's part of their worship. Often we sort of assume Old Testament worship is all sacrifices, and that, that was a big component. But, a, but an equally pivotal companion to that is burning incense. And so incense is part of worship, whether it's true worship, uh, where they're supposed to do in the tabernacle, or whether it's this false worship to other gods, it's part of worship. And if we were to understand that and start to apply that, there's a couple features that will tell us about worship. Four features I'll just briefly give you. The the, the first is that God commands his priests to bring incense. That reminds us that God commands worship. But the second thing to think about worship is the priests stand 18 inches from God when they burn this incense. It's a great picture that shows us that worship is approaching God's presence. That worship is standing before the face of God. It's drawing near his throne. Do we really realize that's what we get to do when we come to church to worship the Lord? And also we can see about worship that that God commands the priests to use this altar every morning and every evening, right? It's to be a perpetual incense burning. Which is a great reminder that worship ought to be constant and regular. It's to be our whole lives. God wants you and I to constantly and regularly come before him and give him praise. We are worshipers every day. 
The question is, what do we elevate and what do we serve and what do we worship every day of the week? And so worship is commanded by God. It approaches God's presence. It is, it is constant. But the, the fourth feature of worship that I think we should really dwell on for a second is that worship goes up to God because of Jesus Christ. Worship goes up to God because of Jesus Christ. Now that's shown to us in this altar in two ways. The, the first is that this altar annually was sprinkled with blood. The Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the priest would come in and they would wash this altar annually with blood, making this altar functional for its purpose. All right, and our text even references that. Don't ever burn altar, uh, offerings on this, except, of course, that one time a year when you're supposed to throw the blood uh, from the bronze altar and you're supposed to put it on this altar. And then a second way is daily. Daily, the incense altar is lit because the sacrifices have already been made on the bronze altar. And so every day they would see it's only by the sacrifice of that altar, the bronze altar, does this altar, the golden altar, function. And in the, both those ways, God is showing his people that the, bronze, the, the golden altar only functions because of the bronze altar, because of the sacrificial system. And we know the sacrificial system, what's that a picture of? It's a picture of Christ on the cross. That we worship and we can come to the golden altar only because Christ has already died on the cross, only because the sacrifice exists. And this is the same way that the New Testament speaks. In 1 Peter 2, 5, he says, you are being built into a spiritual house. You might say a tabernacle or temple. To be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 13 15 says the same thing. It's through Jesus that we continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. That all of our worship is wrapped up by Jesus and then given to the Lord. Jesus has purified your worship for you. So you don't just need Jesus once in a while. You need Jesus every week to approach God. You're constantly approaching the throne of God because of Jesus' sacrifice. Every time we sing in praise, him. And this is shown in that really rather sometimes strange and startling story in uh, Leviticus 10. Remember uh, uh, Moses' nephew, Nadab, and his brother, Abihu? They've just been consecrated as priests. In Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, it says that Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire, or some have tr strange fire or foreign fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. So think about it. The two priests, they take their censers like they're supposed to. They fill them with incense, and then they fill them with fire, and they go to worship God, and then they get killed because they bring the wrong fire. They don't bring the right fire. It's a picture that they weren't coming to God in worship through Christ Jesus. A.W. Pink says it this way, God was very jealous of his types. That's the symbolic meaning of the tabernacle. By their actions, Nadab and Abihu were signifying that worship may be offered to God on another foundation than acceptance through a crucified Christ. And for this, he slew them. It's only through the authorized fire of the sacrificial system, only through Christ, that we get to ever worship. And that's pictured for us, that the cross of Jesus paves the way for this altar, paves the way for our worship. And that's taking this idea of incense generally, taking this idea as a picture of worship, and it is. But if we were to get a little bit more specific in our definition, what is worship, or what is incense specifically? It's, it's worship in general, but more specifically. And, and we can see this throughout the Bible, this, this more specific definition. One of those uh, places we see it is Luke chapter 1. Remember Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, the husband of Elizabeth, 
Zechariah, he's serving as a priest. And remember, he gets, he gets chosen by Lot that he's going to go into the tabernacle or the temple at that time. And what is he supposed to do? He's to go in to burn incense. It's his chosen time. And as he goes in to burn incense at the golden altar, what's going on? All the people outside have assembled to pray. And then the angel of the Lord appeared, stood at the right side of the altar of incense. Zechariah saw him. He was startled, gripped with fear. And the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. It's a picture. It's an example that they knew that this was a place of prayer. The people are outside praying. Zechariah goes in and he's, he's bringing this incense. And it's a symbol of prayer. It's approaching the throne of God. And Gabriel even says in that text, I stand in the presence of God. And Zechariah is coming forward, not listening to this angel who stands in the presence of God. And this same language is picked up in the visions of of Revelation. In Revelation 8, verses 3 and 4 say, Another angel who had a golden censer and stood at the altar... He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up to God from the angel's hand. See, if an angel with the incense standing in this place, and what is the incense? It's with the prayers of the saints. And earlier in the book, in chapter 5, the, the, uh, the 24 elders and the four living creatures have golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Incense, most specifically, is not just worship in general, but it is prayer. And you might think, well, did did Old Testament believers know that? Maybe you have to know the New Testament to understand that. But if you read Psalm 141, David writes at the beginning of that psalm, he says, may my prayer be set before you like incense. They knew it was a picture of incense, that the rising of the incense up to heaven was a picture of God's people and their prayers rising up to the Lord. What does that show us about prayer? Well, it tells us a lot about prayer. It it shows us that prayer is approaching the throne of God, right? When you pray, you're walking right up to the holy of holies, so to speak, it, it's a picture that your prayers are being heard. You know, often we pray and we, we feel like we're outside the tent and outside the courtyard, just kind of lobbing prayers in, hoping it's going to get close enough to God that, that he'll listen. That's the exact opposite of what God wants to tell his people. Prayer is you right in front of God. You're right there. You're as close as you can get. You're at the golden altar standing in front of the Ark of the Covenant, just with a veil to keep God back for your own protection. But your prayers are right there. It reminds us that God hears our prayers well. But it's also a reminder that we're to be praying a lot, right? How often is the incense supposed to be going up? Morning and evening. So there's perpetual incense. The incense is supposed to be constant because God wants his people to constantly be coming before him, constantly praying to him. That prayer is not just an activity we do once in a while. It's a lifestyle that we're to be praying that will make our whole lives a prayer unto God. And so we're to start every day and end every day and to constantly be praying to the Lord. But it also shows us that we pray only because of Jesus. Just like they could only come to this altar because the sacrificial system had washed it and they daily brought coals from those sacrifices. In the same way, we only come to God because there's been a substitute sacrifice for us. The offering of incense is accepted because there's already been a sacrifice for sins out there in the courtyard. Your prayers are accepted because there's already been a sacrifice of Christ Jesus for you. And so we have access to stand before the throne of God, to stand at the golden altar and pray because of what Christ has done in his work. God doesn't equally hear every prayer made to him. But in a special way, he hears the prayers of his people who are in Christ. And so when they would see 
this incense altar. And really when we see this incense altar in Exodus 30, we should be realizing God hears my prayers because of the sacrifice of Christ. But it also tells us that God commands prayer. You know, this altar wasn't Moses' idea. God commands them, you must build this altar. You have to. Because God commands his priests to offer the incense. And it reminds us that God commands us to pray, that God desires our prayers. Israel was supposed to be constantly sending incense up because God wanted it. He desired it. He delighted in it. We're to be praying because God delights in it. He loves to hear the prayers of his people. He doesn't need our prayers, but he is certainly pleased by them. He got, it, it says, Psalm 62, eight says, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him for God is our refuge. We're to be a people that pour out our hearts and our burdens and our cares and our joys and our delights to him because he delights to hear those things. He desires it. And so from the the very placement of this altar, we see prayer is approaching the throne of God. From the very timing of this altar, morning and evening, we see prayer is to be constantly going to God. We see from the very source of this altar, the fire source, that prayer only arrives at God because of Jesus' sacrifice. And then we see from the command to build this that prayer is a God-intended activity. He wants us to pray. You start to see that this golden altar of incense, you thought it was only in Exodus 30, but it's in Leviticus 10 with Nadab and Abihu, and it's in Zechariah 1 in the Christmas story, and it's also in Revelation. It's all over the scripture. I want to show you one other place where we learn about this altar. It's in, it's in 2 Chronicles 26. You probably haven't read that recently, but it's about King Uzziah. King Uzziah becomes king of Judah when he's age 16. He is a good king at first. He he strengthens Israel. He is following the Lord. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, it says. And then he becomes proud. And his pride leads to his downfall. And one day, King Uzziah enters the temple with a censer in his hand to burn incense at this altar. And Azariah and 80 priests confront the king. And they say, leave the sanctuary. Basically, your prayer's not going to get heard. You're not supposed to do this. And King Uzziah gets livid. He, he starts raging and spewing out words of anger in front of all the priests, right in front of the golden altar of incense. And as he's doing this, leprosy breaks out on his forehead. And the priests immediately, and Isaiah himself realized, and it rushes out of the temple, lest he be killed at that very moment. Because he realizes he's unclean. It's a picture that he was unclean, and he couldn't enter there. And Uzziah lives the rest of his life in quarantine. He's isolated, doesn't really function as king anymore, because he becomes a leper. You see, Uzziah thought his obedience, his prosperity, meant that he could approach God and pray to God in the temple, even though he wasn't a Levite. And basically God said, no. You may be the king, but you're not a priest. You need a priest. We need to see that the user of this golden altar is always and only a priest. Now you and I in the New Testament are priests in Christ. So it reminds us we can come to God in prayer because we're united to Christ and so our prayers are heard. But it also reminds us that Jesus is our high priest. He is our priest that goes before us. A a priest just represents the people. Well, Jesus came to be your priestly representative. He he took on flesh so he could be your priest. He came to earth to, to fulfill that glorious role. And really symbolically, after the sacrifice on the cross, you might say after he went to the bronze altar, he entered the tabernacle, he went up into heaven, 
And then he went to the golden altar. He goes to the throne of God and he ever lives to intercede for you. So not how Hebrews 7 puts it, that Jesus is that priest who is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest meets our needs. You see, you and I don't just need a priest who forgives us. We don't just need Jesus to forgive us once in a while, though we do need that. But we need a priest, a person who goes to God for us, who prays for us. A priest speaks to God on your behalf, and Jesus is speaking to God on your behalf. Romans 8, 34 says the same thing, that he is indeed interceding for us. He's praying for us. Do you ever have someone tell you they're praying for you? And, and not, there's times when you, you have it in the Christianized way and it means they're thinking about you. But then there's those times when you know the person is praying for you by name every single day. You, can, you get that impression. And if somebody tells you they're praying for you about that individually, you, it's very encouraging. Well, Jesus prays for you every single day. He stands before the incense altar in the presence of God and he offers up incense that is your prayers and his prayers about your prayers go to God. Henry Law said this, he said, Satan often will whisper that our prayers are weak and worthless and nothing but insults to the ears of God. Alas, that is too often true, but hope relies not on our holiest work, Christ prays. Christ prays most worthily, and in his prayers, acceptance stands. Our praises are often as a dull, smoldering smoke, but Jesus' voice is heard. His merits sweeten our shortcoming utterance. Christ ever loves, and he proves his love by unceasing prayers. You see, the work of Jesus is not uh, distant and far. It's, it's not just for a day when you feel overwhelmed by guilt. The work of Jesus is for weary Christians. The activity of Jesus, your priest, is for tired believers. That he's standing before the throne of God, praying for you. And he came to earth to do just that. He took on flesh so he could be that representative priest for you and for me to pray for us. I want to end with a, a quote by, by Charles Spurgeon. It's a bit long, but it's rich. He says, how encouraging is the thought of the Redeemer's never ceasing intercession for us. When we pray, he pleads for us. And we're not praying. He is advocating our cause. And by his supplications, shielding us from unseen dangers. We, know, we little know what we owe to our Savior's prayers. When we reach the hilltops of heaven and look back upon all the way whereby the Lord our God has led us, how we shall praise him who before the eternal throne undid the mischief which Satan was doing upon earth. O oh, Jesus, what a comfort it is that you have pleaded our cause against our unseen enemies and unmasked their ambushes. Here is a matter for joy, gratitude, hope, and confidence. You see what he's saying? We're gonna look back in heaven. We're gonna look back over the way and the road and all the different things. We're gonna see tripwires and ambushes and things we didn't know were there. And we're gonna go, how did we make it? Oh, wow, Jesus was praying for you. That's why. And so Jesus' priestly duty, his daily prayer of life, is a great matter of joy, of gratitude, of hope, and of confidence. So be assured your Savior is praying for you this day. Let's go before him in prayer. Our great God, we come before you we thank you that you love us so dearly, so tenderly, daily, sending Christ to be our priest every day, to 
bring the incense to the golden altar and pray for us, pray for your people. We thank you that you continually to take our works that seem good at first and we strive for and you bring it to the Father. You take our songs and our thanksgiving and you bring them to the Father. And we thank you for that, Jesus. And may you assure us and fill us with hope, with confidence, with joy, with gratitude, knowing that you are interceding on our behalf. And we pray that your people now, all of us would realize that, have faith to grasp that and to understand that, and that you would give us peace and assurance and thanksgiving in our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.